Welcome to Kingdoms in Conflict. I'm your host, Dr. Eric Wallace. What is the key to upward mobility? And what does that look like? Is it education or family, or is it a combination of the two? We'll talk with Ian Rowe, the Senior Fellow for Education, Upward Mobility, Family Formation, and Adoption at the American Enterprise Institute. Mr. Rowe will address these questions and more when we return. Welcome to Kingdoms in Conflict. I'm your host, Dr. Eric Wallace, and we're privileged to have Mr. Ian Rowe with us today. How are you doing, sir? I am doing very well. Thank you for having me on. Oh, it's our pleasure. It's our pleasure. Now, you've done some work for the American Enterprise Institute, where you're the senior fellow, and your focus is on what? Education, upward mobility, family formation, and adoption. And that's yeah. actually a lot. So I'd like you to address all four of these issues one at a time, but... Um, Let's start with education. Right. Well, uh, you know, upward mobility, education, adoption, family formation, they're all connected actually back to a singular thing, which is family, uh, strong families, which is the foundation of, of any healthy society. And, and so if I talk about education, I first have to just give you a little bit of okay. my personal background, because that has very much informed my view of the world. And, and, um, like most of us, we are very heavily influenced by who our parents were. And my parents, uh, Vincent and Eula Rowe, uh, came to this country from Jamaica, West Indies uh, in the mid 1960s. And as you might imagine, there was a lot of racial strife uh, in the country at the time. And so they knew that that was gonna be part of the, you know, part of the reality of living in America, that they, they and their children would likely face some form of racial discrimination. But the one thing that they knew was that the country was changing, you know, that there were opportunities that were being developed. You know, there was a civil rights act, there were all these, there was a lot of movement, even amongst the tumult. And, uh, but the one thing my dad always would say, and my mom, is that you've gotta be ready. You've gotta be ready for when those opportunities come your way. And so they very much emphasized the importance of education. You know, when I, when I was, uh, growing up in, in elementary school and junior high school is sort of, <clears throat> you go to school in the morning, come home, do your homework, go to bed, uh, go to school in the morning, <laughs> you know, come home, uh, do your homework. And so it was just a, just a really intense focus on uh, academics, becoming a good person, uh, understanding your commitment back to your community. All of those things are really important to my family and to my, you know, my parents in particular, and so I had a great uh, K to 12 public education. Uh, and I, I've always believed that that is the great equalizer, regardless of uh, the zip code you're born into, the family structure you're born into, that every kid has to have access to a powerful uh, tuition-free public education. It's a, it's a fundamental building block of upward mobility. I wrote a, pa a paper or an article not too long ago calling education the last civil right that if there's anything that, as you say, would make it an equalizer, allow people to compete, it's having a good education. And I think that's, the, one of my questions was, what do we mean when we say education? You know, how are we defining it? Because there's apprenticeship, there's formal education, there's vocational, elementary. I mean, what do we mean when we, when we say education? Yeah, no, it's a really good question. And the thing that we always have to remind ourselves when we talk about education is that parents, are the first educators. You know, if you look at the time that a child spends over the course of their life, you know, first of all, from ages zero to five, for many kids, there's no school, there's no formal schooling at all. It's all about your family environment. And even when you do go to school, the vast majority of your, your, your evenings and your sleep time is at home. So I never want to, even when I'm talking about education, I never want to neglect the absolute critical importance of parents uh, to provide the environment so that you can study well, you get good nourishment, you're healthy, all the other things, your social emotional development, which sometimes, because I think sometimes um, in education, we're kind of more and more gravitating towards the school 
becoming the anchor to do all of these things almost usurp the role of parent. Right, so, right. so I so I do wouldn't want to just emphasize that point. Um, as it relates to formal education, uh, you know, uh, fundamentally, uh, choice is something I think that's really important. In that, again, parents have to decide what is best. What do they believe is best for their own child? Do they do they think that their child should be in a single sex school? Do they want their child to go into a religious school? Do they want their child to be in a school for the arts? And the thing is, middle and upper class families throughout our country have that choice every day. They can send their kids to a private school. They can move to a beautiful suburb. Um, they can move to a great zip code in a city and have access to a, a, a school of their choice. But unfortunately for a lot of low income kids in both urban and rural areas, they don't have that choice. And a lot of those schools haven't been uh, educating kids well for generations. And so for me, I advocate a lot for parental choice in education, uh, because I think a lot of it starts there. So I've got two really important questions for you. You talk about family formation, but what do you mean by that specifically? And, and, and there's this other piece of adoption. I'm sure those two go together, right? Yes. Well, again, almost all of my work is anchored in strong families. And so uh, family formation is really uh, connected to this idea of the timing of family formation. So there's something called the success sequence, which is um, it's 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 a it's a fancy title on what many people think is just sort of common sense, but the data is overwhelming. If you finish just your high school uh, degree, uh, then you know hopefully you get some college. But even if you just get a high school degree, you get a full time job of any kind, just so you learn the dignity and discipline of work. And if you have children, marriage first, 97% of millennials who who've followed that series of decisions, education, work, marriage, then children, 97% avoid poverty. And something like close to 80% enter the middle class or above. The numbers are just, just staggering. So when I think about family formation, I think that's really important information for young people to have so that they know, you know, before they start making their decisions about their own lives, you know, their decisions about relationships, work, having children, that they understand what the likelihood of success is and how critical their timing of for family formation is to their own long-term success. So it's almost it's not about the family that you're from, it's about the family that you form mm -hmm. that will have a significant impact on your likelihood of success. And adoption, you know, I have the uh, honor of being the chairman of the board of Spence Chapin, which is one of the country's oldest adoption agencies and ama an amazing organization. And there, there are um, a number of babies that are born into very challenging situations uh, and not enough uh, um, uh, young women uh, know or consider adoption as a realistic option. There's often, they'll either consider abortion or single parenthood, marriage is often out of the question, uh, but adoption is never really considered. And so one of the things we're trying to do is at least let, at least let more uh, young women know about all of the choices that they have and that infant adoption should be one of those for the purpose of st forming uh, strong families. Have you taken a look at, at why, um, at least in, in the black community, that there's been a, I don't, I don't wanna say a push, but lack for a better word, a push away or a migration away from marriage? I don't understand yeah, that. Yeah, that's devastating, that that's devastating. Well, again, for me, family, strong families are the foundation for almost everything else that we care about. Like many of the issues that, that a lot of us uh, our folk, you know, or many policymakers, you know, they're focused on mass incarceration, they're focused on poverty, they're focused on uh, bad healthcare outcomes. Well, a lot of those things, if you really look at the data, are tied back to what were the environments that kids were raised in, and, and in particular, the family structure. And in the Black community, 
Uh, it is true, you know, when Daniel Patrick Moynihan wrote his uh, famous uh, labor study back in the 1960s, he was saying single parenthood within the black community was at crisis levels. We had to be addressed. And at that time, the non-marital birth rate was 23.6%, which was a crisis at the time. Right. That right. number now is 70% in the black community. And by the way, in the white community, it's now about 30%. So even higher than the levels that Moynihan thought was a crisis for the black community 50 years ago. And there are a lot of implications for all, because now, um, you know, in some ways, the black community was the canary in the coal mine in that, you know, the yeah. white community is catching up. I particularly do research on women 24 and under. The non-marital birth rate in 2019 for black women, for black women 24 and under who had a baby in 2019, 91% were outside of marriage. Wow. In the white community, it was 61%. I mean, these numbers are these numbers wow. are devastating. And on top of that, about 40% of those births of women 24 and under, mm -hmm. about 40% of those women were having at least their second child. The, the implications of this are significant and we have to talk about it. It's not just in the black community because I now call this what I call an equal opportunity tsunami um, because the, ch the conditions are tough. Now, we gotta say, there are some amazing single mothers they're, they're, and they're dysfunctional two-parent homes. Right. So nothing is a guarantee. Um, you know, I run schools in the heart of the South Bronx with amazing um, you know, single moms who are determined to have their kids have better life outcomes than they. So you have, to, you have to acknowledge that. That said, the data is overwhelming that uh, Outcomes are better, better for kids in married two-parent households in the Black community and others. I just did a study, actually, uh, where, we sh where we showed that Black kids raised in married two-parent households had less poverty, uh, less incarceration, and higher college graduation rates than white kids raised in single-parent households. Um, and uh, so for me... I want to dispel this notion that marriage somehow is only uh, a practice in the white community when it's, when it's central to outcomes for, for everyone, but especially for folks in the black community. Which leads me to my next question. What is the key to upward mobility? I mean, that you're basically uh, getting to it in what you just said, but I know there's more. Yeah, well, you know, it's a, it's a, you know, it's, it's kind of a $64,000 question. I've been thinking about this a lot, of just what are the ingredients, particularly for young people who may be growing up in low income situations, they may be hearing, you know, this is an oppressive society, this is a systemically racist society, you're oppressed, you know, your oppressor is the one that has to release you, and it's very debilitating. You know, if you're a 12 year old kid, you hear that over and over and over and over again, you just think the system is rigged against you and you don't feel that you have any agency to be the architect of your own destiny. So I've been thinking a lot about what do we, uh, what framework do we provide for young people to think about their own life destiny and how they can overcome this victimhood narrative and lead a self-determined life. And I, I define the word agency as the force of your free will guided by moral discernment. So it's like agency like is a that. vector. It's got speed, but it needs direction, right? Mm -hmm. So you, you have speed, but what's gonna uh, you know, veer you in certain directions or another? And I've created this framework called free, family, religion, education, entrepreneurship, free. Because um, if a young person embraces those four elements in their life, their likelihood of significant upward mobility is much higher than if they don't have those elements. So family, again, it's not about the family that you're from, it's about the family you form. And if you follow the success sequence of education, work, marriage, then children, you're almost guaranteed not to be in poverty. R is for religion. The data is overwhelming 
that if you have a faith commitment in your life, and doesn't mean it doesn't matter if it's Christianity, uh, Buddhism, but living by a set of spiritual principles provides the kind of foundation that allows you to um, uh, look towards your life and look towards your afterlife. Uh, and to know that your afterlife is improved by what you do today. So that's the R. The E is about education. It's about ensuring that you have the opportunity to go to a great school, um, to do well in school, to apply yourself, because that knowledge can never be taken away from you. And then the final E is entrepreneurship. It's about generating wealth, not just financial wealth, but also spiritual wealth, also wealth and relationships. This, this idea that you have an entrepreneurial mindset that you can build something um, towards the future. And again, it's not only financial. I mean, Booker T. Washington in the early 1900s uh, partnered with Julius Rosenwald, the CEO of Sears Roebuck, to build 5,000 schools in the South specifically for Black children because of the inferior options that Black kids uh, had in front of them. So it was a very entrepreneurial um, idea and said, I've, I see a problem and I want to solve it. And so this idea of family, religion, education, entrepreneurship, of, if a young person embraces those, to me, those are the elements that I think give you a better shot of achieving upward mobility, regardless of your beginning circumstance. Let me add to that piece on religion, since I'm an ordained pastor. <laughs> uh, one of the things I think that religion also, especially, oh, I have to speak to Christianity because that's my, that's where I live, um, is that there's also a piece of dis discipline that's in, that's in that. Um, if you have a religious faith, there's certain things that, that you're just not going to do. Um, yeah. That your scriptures, your belief system says there's certain things that Christians just don't do, such as, you know, a lot of bad behavior like lying and, you know, things yeah. like that. And so... It gives you some guardrails, if you will, kind of use your analogy. You have all this energy and how do you direct it? And it helps get, put up those guardrails so you don't go too far to the left or too far to the right or, or what have you. Um, and I think those, are important. those were important for me when I was, I, I became a Christian at 16. And so it helped direct me. And that's before I got, you know, involved any chance for me getting involved in anything. It just so happened I was very shy too. So, yep. <laughs> so I never got involved in drugs. I never did any of that stuff. Yeah, same here, same here. That's the irony of leading a life of freedom is that actually having constraints yes. or sort of a code of behavior actually will give you greater chances of liberation to give you, give you, um, you know, better options later on. But yeah, that's why the that's why the R is in there. Personal faith commitment is just absolutely crucial. And again, we're in a, we're in a time where religiosity is going down. More yeah. young people define themselves as what they call nuns, N-O-N-E-S, as having no religious affiliation. And I think we just have to try and reintroduce that to young people as a source of strength. And unfortunately, I think part of that problem is the problem of the church. I just interviewed somebody recently, a pastor, and we've had a number of pastors on, talking about the relevancy of the church today. Um, it's good that you can talk to Jesus, you know, did this, that, or the other, and the, but if you're not ask, answering the so what, mm -hmm. what does this have to do with me? How does right. this affect my relationship with my friends, school, things happening in school, critical race theory, the 1619 yeah. Project, all yeah. these things that are coming at young people, um, the whole you know, transgender piece, you know, you can yep. change your gender. I mean, all these things are coming at it. And a lot of this stuff is, is actually uh, counter uh, religious, anti religious, anti biblical. Oh, okay. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, it's anti biblical. And what's interesting is that for a lot of young people that don't have a personal faith commitment, this ideology is almost becoming a religion. Yes. Right? The sort of wokeness that there's, there's a, you, you can be excommunicated if, if you don't um, agree with the anti-racist ideology uh, in its specific format, you know, the only way to solve discrimination is to discriminate now. And, and uh, you know, America is a systemically racist country and all these things. It, it's almost become a religion, like this level of wokeness 
Um, yes. And I think part of that is because of the, the lack of a real uh, spiritual faith commitment where young people would realize, no, you know what, these things don't make sense. And I'm not going to demonize someone solely because of their skin color, or I'm not going to consider someone oppressed be simply because of their skin color. And that rather I should treat each person as a human being. It's like intersectionality. I know we were talking about that. Intersectionality is, is, is typically framed as, you know, layer of layer of, of uh, oppressed identities. I'm black, I'm a woman, I'm gay. It's like, oh, I'm triply oppressed. Well, actually the logical conclusion of intersectionality, if you take all the elements of a human being, you get the individual. And because yes, you're, you're intersectional in lots of ways. You're a, you're a guy, you were born in a certain country, you were raised in a certain way. All of those elements intersect to create you as a human being. And sometimes I think the lack of a spiritual faith commitment makes it harder to, for people just to uh, just believe in the divine beauty of each human being. And I think that's where we're gonna close this one. <laughs> for, uh, it's, it's so great to have you on. Uh, I know we're gonna do a part two to this uh, and I look forward to doing that. Um, it's great to have you. I, I didn't get a chance to talk about the 1776 Unites. Uh, we'll do that in our next interview. Uh, and those who are watching, uh, we'll be back in just a moment. Hi, I'm Dr. Eric Wallace, president and co-founder of Freedom's Journal Institute for the study of faith and public policy. And I'm here today to tell you about a project that we're really excited about. It's called Racism in America and the Role of the Church. We live in a time and day of conspiracy, a threat to the poor, a threat to the have-nots. We're doing this series because we believe that the black church needs to hear another voice. There's a voice out there that is secular. Society as well as the media are pushing the narrative that there's a resurgence in racism in America, especially with the rise of, of groups like Black Lives Matter and other protest groups. It's tearing the church apart. And I believe it's time for the, for the church in general, and the African-American church in particular, to have a, a, another voice that has a different point of view, a biblical worldview. I'd ask you to prayerfully consider making a donation to this project. Thank you. Welcome back. The R in Mr. Rowe's acronym, FREE, is a real faith commitment. In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus addresses this in the parable of the sower in chapter eight. It is an illustration of the Christian community to whom Luke is writing and what constitutes faithfulness. Jesus tells us in Luke chapter eight, verse 10, quote, to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God, but to others I speak in parables, so that looking they may not perceive and listening they may not understand, end quote. The major theme of chapter eight, verses one through 21, is hearing the word of God and doing it. To fully understand what Luke is getting at, let us explore Luke chapter eight, verses 11 through 21, to gain insight into what is happening and why many lack understanding, leading to a faithful walk with God. Let's look at Jesus' explanation of the parable of the sower, understanding that the seed is the word of God and that the sower is the messenger of God. Jesus mentions four types of ground which the seed fell. He then speaks of how the seed did or did not take root. Jesus will parallel this later with the condition of a person's heart and how they hear. Therefore, I will speak of the ground in terms of the condition of, of one's heart. In verse 12, Jesus says that one type of person hears the word, yet before it can germinate and sprout roots, the devil comes and takes it out of their heart. The Greek word for take away means to take from another what is his or what was committed to him. The devil is a pickpocket of the heart. He steals the seed meant for a person to believe. The word for believe also means to be persuaded of. These people are what can be called detached hearts. They are detached from spiritual truth. They are devoid of spiritual truth, unable to process or understand the kingdom of God. They don't come seeking spiritual truth and the devil aims to keep it that way. Therefore they hear but never understand. These people are lost. The seed that falls on the rocky soil in verse 13 are people who receive the word with joy but have no firm root. Jesus says they believe for a season. So when a period of testing comes, they fall away. The word for fall away also means to withdraw, to become aloof. These are people whose faith is based on a 
continual spiritual or emotional high. They receive the word of God with joy or gladness, yet once they come off the high, they have no foundation. Their belief is superficial. It has no root. When hard times come, they complain and gripe and lose heart. They are the disillusioned hearts. Galatians 6, 9 says, let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up, end quote. The delay in the appearance of Jesus and the persecution of the saints during Luke's time would produce people such as these. The seed among the thorns in verse 14 is unlike the detached hearts or the disillusioned hearts. This seed among the thorns takes root and begins to bear fruit. Unfortunately, the fruit never becomes ripe or mature. This is the distracted heart. Jesus tells us that because of his person's anxiety over riches and the pleasures of life, they never produce ripe fruit. Paul would call these carnal Christians living in the flesh and trying to live their Christianity out by their own means. They focus on their problems instead of the problem solver. These people are lost, have lost their focus. Luke 12, 34 says, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also, end quote. And Luke 12, 29 through 31 says, quote, And do not set your heart on what you shall eat or drink. Do not worry about it, for the pagan world runs after such things, and your father knows that you need them. But seek his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well, end quote. Hence, their preoccupation with material things has stunted their spiritual growth, and no fruit develops to maturity. The cares of the world have taken priority, and what would, would or should have been a vineyard of edible fruit has become overgrown with weeds, thorns, and thistles. The faith that should have developed has been choked out, fostered by an inability to understand the word of God and hear it and bear edible fruit. Question, what is the condition of your heart? The good ground in verse 15 is what I call developing or devoted heart. This heart is characterized as being good and honest. Unlike the detached heart, it holds fast to the seed or the word of God. The word for hold fast also means to take possession. They possess the word that God has for them and they bear fruit with patience. The disillusioned heart had no patience or perseverance. The detached heart had no patience either and could bring no fruit to maturity. The word for perfection or maturity is used to describe a pregnant woman about to give birth. The devoted heart person's perseverance brings forth, quote, with a good and honest heart, end quote, ripe, delicious golden apples, luscious grapes, succulent peaches, and juicy watermelons. The word for patience or perseverance in the New Testament is used of a person who is not moved or veered from his or her deliberate purpose to faith and piety by the greatest trial and suffering. In other words, come hell or high water, they will trust God. These are true believers. They persevere to the end. Luke tries to get his readers to be like the good ground or the developing heart that bears much fruit. The condition of one's heart determines how one hears or receive God's word. And how we receive God's words determines whether we will be fruitful or not. We are kingdoms in conflict.